Hi everybody, my name is Doug Johnson and in this presentation I'll be talking about some work I did looking at learning outcomes data in India. Uh, so before I begin, I'd like to thank Andres Prado of ID Insight who did a lot of the original analysis that this work is based on. Um, so in India, there's two main sources of data on learning outcomes. You have the ACER survey and the NAS survey. Uh, and the goal of this analysis is to assess the reliability of those two data sets. And I do this in two ways. Uh, so first I compare ACER and NAS to each other, as well as to a third data set. And then second, I decompose uh, variants and changes in ACER scores over time. And I find that, you know, overall, um, it seems like NAS scores appear unrealistically high and contain little information about relative state performance. Uh, on the other hand, ACER scores are reliable measures of learning outcomes, but just a tad bit noisier than one would expect based on sample size. Uh, so before I dive into the analysis, I'll give a brief introduction to ACER and NAS, as well as this third data set I use, the India Human Development Survey. Uh, so ACER, the ACER survey is led by the independent ACER Center uh, and implemented with the help of a variety of different partners. Uh, the goal of the survey, uh, and I'm basically talking about the ACER basic survey, is to assess basic literacy and numeracy. And they do this by administering an assessment tool orally and one-on-one. -on -one. The sampling strategy for the ACER survey is very similar to a typical household survey. So first they randomly select a set of villages. Within those villages, they randomly select a set of households. And then they administer this assessment tool to all children ages 5 to 16 in those households. Uh, by contrast, NAS is a government-led survey. And the goal of the NAS survey is to assess whether students are achieving grade level competency. It's a, it's a standard paper and pencil test. Um, you know, so they, they hand out these test papers to students that they fill them out on their own. Uh, and the sampling strategy is school-based. So they first randomly select a set of government and private aided schools. And then within each of those schools, they randomly select a set of students in grades three, five, and eight. Uh, and, and third, I use uh, data from this India Human Development Survey. This is a survey that was conducted most recently in 2011, 2012. It's a very in-depth, comprehensive household survey that's representative of the entire country. Um, and one of the cool things that they did is they, they used, the, they administered the ACER tool to all children in their sample ages eight to 11. Um, so, you know, as you saw, the, the ACER and NAS use different sampling strategies and different assessment tools. So, uh, you know, a, a, a comparison of overall ACER and NAS scores at the, at the state level wouldn't be valid. So, so before comparing these three data sets, um, what I try to do is make them as similar as possible by restricting the samples. And I do this in three ways. So first, I focus on grade three reading outcomes. And the reason I do that is because um, achieving the highest level on the ACER reading uh, assessment corresponds roughly to a second grade reading level or being able to read a second grade level text. And that's the closest thing in the ACER um, test, which corresponds directly to a, you know, a, 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 a grade level competency. Uh, similarly, I focus just on rural areas. ACER does not include urban areas. And I focus just on government and private aided schools. Uh, because NAS does not include private schools. Okay, so what do we see after we, uh, when we compare these three data sets that are restricted uh, in, in such a way? Th this, this graph shows ACER, IHDS, and NAS state averages. Um, for ACER, ACER and IHDS, it's the percentage of kids in grade three who have achieved that highest level on the reading exam, uh, i.e. they're able to understand a standard two level text in NAS, it's grade three level students who are um, reading at a grade three level. Um, and, and what you see is that uh, ACER and IHDS uh, averages are, are pretty similar to each other. There's a few states for which there's uh, some, some substantial differences, but overall you see uh, that they're very similar across most of the states. Whereas for NAS, the, the state averages are much, much higher. And you can't really see that from that previous graph, but what, what you can see from this graph is that the state uh, rankings are not at all similar across ACER and NAS. So what this graph is showing you is the rank in ACER on the x-axis compared to the rank on, uh, in NAS 
uh, on the y-axis. And what you can see is there's almost no correlation between the two. Um, so uh, the obvious question from that analysis is, you know, why are ACER and NAS state averages so different? Um, and, and I think there's a few potential reasons, but I think we can rule out most of these potential reasons. Um, so the first potential reason is that it's just due to sampling error. I think we can very confidently rule that out as an explanation because the sample sizes for both of these surveys are, are absolutely massive. Uh, the, the second potential reason is ACER non-sampling error. Um, and I think we can pretty confidently rule that out as well. There, you know, there, there might be some uh, ACER non-sampling error, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but it's, it's nowhere on the order of uh, um, something that would cause these two data sets to be not correlated whatsoever. Um, you know, third, uh, it could be that there's subtle differences in whatever it is they're trying to measure. Um, and, and this is possible, I can't 100% rule this out, but I find it highly unlikely. You know, if you look at just state averages for ACER reading and ACER math, uh, they're, they're highly correlated, they're above 0.8. And I think what that shows is that, you know, even if you look at two kind of abilities that are, are subtly different, there, there's still a, a substantial degree of correlation there. So, so uh, I, I find it pretty unlikely that um, you could measure anything that, that corresponds to a, a reading ability and get a correlation this low. Um, so I think if you rule out those three explanations, um, the, the thing you end up with is that the, the reason for the discrepancy is most likely due to NAS non-sampling error. Um, and, and it's, I, I can't really break it down, you know, um, NAS doesn't make its test questions public, uh, so, so I can't really break down the, the cause of the non-sampling error, whether it's like students not showing up at exam day or differences in test questions across states, but I think we can pretty confidently say it's probably not NAS non-sampling error. Okay, so the second thing I do in the paper is to look at um, uh, ACER's internal reliability. And I do that by decomposing uh, uh, variance and changes in ACER scores into persistent and transitory components. And intuitively, what these approaches do is they look at whether you know year-to-year -year changes in ACER scores stick, i.e. they're not reversed in future years. And the, the underlying logic of that approach is that you know if a change reflects a true, an observed change reflects a true change in underlying learning outcomes, you would expect the, 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 the change to stick. But if you see like a temporary blip in one year that's immediately reversed in the next year, it's most likely due to measurement error rather than uh, reflective of a true change in underlying learning outcomes. Um, now, I, I can't you know, confidently say that transitory changes are 100% uh, non-sampling error, um, but I think there's a couple of reasons why um, it, it, it's reasonable to think that they're probably non-sampling error. Now, the first reason is that uh, most education policies are for multiple years. So I think it would be unlikely that you would see like a temporary blip in learning outcomes just for one year. And, and then second, I, I show in the data that um, th these differences, year-to-year -year differences, um, most likely are not explained by differences between cohorts. So, you know, the other reason, it could be not necessarily that there's more learning aids in a year, but it could just be like the, the kids coming into third grade in year X are, um, do a lot better than the, the kids in grade three in grade three in year X plus one and X minus one. And, and I showed that's, that's probably not what's happening here. Um, okay, so before diving into the formal variance decomposition, I think it's useful just to look at uh, kind of the trend lines of ACER scores over time. Um, what this graph is showing is ACER grade three and grade five reading levels. Uh, for grade five, I think it's what, it's what it's showing is the proportion of kids who are able to read at the highest level, the standard two level text. And for grade three, it's one level below that, the sentence level um, for years 2006 to 2014. And what you can see from these, from this graph is that there does appear to be substantial kind of jumpiness to the data. You know, there's kind of like some uh, uh, squiggles going on in those lines. Um, so this final graph shows the formal results from the variance decomposition. And I think there's three main takeaways from this graph. Uh, the first is that if you look at the state levels, the, the majority of the variance is persistent. 
And, and I interpret this to mean that you can be relatively confident when comparing states using ACER data. Um, second, the story changes slightly when you look at changes in state levels or you go to district data. There, a, a much larger proportion uh, a, a, of the variance is made up of the, this transitory component. And I think what, um, what that means is you have to be a little bit more careful when, say, comparing changes in state levels over time. Uh, and you have to be really careful if you're looking at, say, changes in district levels over time. <clears throat> and I think the last you know, key takeaway from this graph is that across all these different categories, um, sampling variance makes up a, a very small portion of that transitory variance. So to wrap up, I think the, the, this analysis has implications both for how we use this data as well as uh, any potential future data collection of learning outcomes. So first, when it comes to how we use this data, I, I, I think this analysis shows that policymakers and researchers should be extremely cautious when using NAS data. When it comes to ACER data, I think the analysis shows that you should just be a little bit cautious when comparing changes in state averages over time or when using district data. Um, now, when it comes to potential future data collection, uh, I, I think what this analysis shows is that it would be useful to better understand what happened in that last round of NAS before repeating the exercise. Um, you know, based on my uh, um, review of the, the NAS materials, the, the, the survey guides, the sampling instructions, it seems like it's a pretty well thought out, well designed, well monitored survey. So there, there doesn't appear to be any obvious reason for these big discrepancies that we see. Um, so before kind of launching into another big round of NAS uh, or, or a big round of data collection that uses a similar strategy, it'd be really useful to understand whether it, you know, these discrepancies might be due to uh, students not showing up or differences in test questions or whatever it is. Um, the second big implication, I think, from this analysis is that even for ACER, the non-sampling error is much larger than the sampling error. So theoretically, if you had a household survey that achieved zero non-sampling error, you could achieve similar levels of precision to ACER with a fraction of the sample size. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you very much.